Good evening. So good evening, everybody. Ciao, Pietro. We, I wanted to notice he's late, you know, so that everybody noticed he's late. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome, so, to the, our, the opening of our inauguration of our academic year for 2022-2023. I'm really deeply happy and honored to uh, be able to open this academic year. And we are really very happy and very fortunate to have with us Professor David Card from Berkeley, who also won the Nobel Prize for Economics last year, as you all know. So it's really a great honor to have him here. And what is really nice is that he's not just uh, visiting, but uh, he is spending some time at Il Collegio Carlo Alberto. And this is the sign, really a very important sign of the quality of the research that the Collegio is doing. Uh, David is interacting with Francesco De Vicenti at the Department of Economics of the University of Torino and with other scholars at the University of Torino. So there is a deep interaction uh, around his work with the local faculty, which is very important for us. It's a sign that essentially there are, his research have also deep roots in the University of Turin. So David, I'm really very pleased that you are here and we're really very happy to have you uh, with us. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so, Bruno is a long time friend, and, uh, and Bruno Contini also you have plenty of friends here, actually. Actually, I, I asked David to give his lecture in Italian, so he, might, <laughs> he may be trying, but I don't know, we're not sure. Anyway, I'm really happy, and as I said, the, you know, the, there are deep roots between his work and Il Collegio, and Il Collegio is really striving to become a really a, 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 a research institution and a teaching institution at the European frontier. Uh, we are, our faculty is growing. We have now a faculty that it's uh, uh, made, composed of also almost 18 people who are internal in the Collegio Carlo Alberto and work partly between Il Collegio and the University of Turin, 18 between uh, uh, postdoc uh, chairs at Il Collegio senior chairs and junior chairs. We have 51 fellows and affiliates who are professors of the University of Turin that spend time at Il Collegio Carlo Alberto. The Collegio has an, a very strong output in research. We have uh, more, this just last year, more than 260 publications, of which 157 scientific publications. And so you say the research activity of Il Collegio are very important, and in the areas of research of David, which is labor market migrations and welfare in general, I think there is a lot of work that is being done at Il Collegio, so we're very happy of that. Uh, of course, as you know, we are opening the academic year, so we are also, the college is also very much about education and about teaching. Uh, we are, I must say we are really enormously proud of our program, which is Il Programma Allievi, that as you know, it's a honor program for the best student of the University of Turin. i just give you a list of where, what was the placement of some of our students in 2022, uh, Banca Centrale Europea, uh, the PhD in economics, so the ECB in Frankfurt, uh, PhD in economics, University of Pennsylvania, uh, PhD in statistics and data science, Carnegie Mellon, uh, equity research at Mediobanca, credit risk management at UBS, uh, doctorate in political and social sciences at the European University in Fiesole. So our students really have an incredible placement in three months. They, they all find a job, and they don't find any job. They find really very good jobs. So we're really very proud of our students, our classes, and our teaching program. Of course, besides for the Allievi, we have uh, the, uh, we have several masters and other teaching activities. We just started this year a uh, program, a master program with IMPS. Uh, this is uh, a new program, a new master program. It's a program on welfare and data management. Actually, I must reveal that David has a tie from IMPS. It was given to him. I told him, don't say it's an IMPS tie, but I'm going to reveal it myself. <laughs> he has a tie from IMPS because he gave a lecture at IMPS also, but we have a connection with IMPS because we have a, a master 
uh, new master with them that we are organizing jo jointly with them. And then, of course, we have a lot of activities, of outreach activities. Uh, last year, we had uh, almost 53 uh, outreach events, which has been strengthened, as you, most of you know, by the fact that we host the International Festival of Economics that will be again this year between June 1, 4, and it's about rethinking globalization is a very important subject, and David will be uh, with us again, so that is also very important. The college is really doing a lot of work in terms of outreach, and I think these are times in which we need to think more and more, buongiorno, more and more about what's happening in the world and what you know, economic and social events are, and we need deep thinking, not just slogans. So I think that that's really a, work, a job that the Collegio is doing. The Collegio is very highly integrated with the University of Turin. Uh, as you know, we, many of, most of our faculty is partly here, partly at the University of Turin. We have worked a lot with uh, the rector Stefano Geona to really to foster this link between uh, the two institutions, and I think this is working very well. Uh, it's a, a multidisciplinary endeavor. Uh, we have expanded a lot, not only the activities in economics, but also in the social and political sciences. And uh, I think we have a very, very good group of uh, social scientists now at Il Collegio that are, who are doing really very well. We're, doing, we're working a lot with the law department also, and also in statistics and mathematics. So we are really a multidisciplinary institution. We are trying to work as much as possible as a multidisciplinary institution. So the University of Torino is a founding member of uh, the Collegio, and so I'm really pleased that uh, Stefano Geona, who is the rector of the University of Turin, can say a couple of welcoming words, and then we will have a great introduction to Professor David Kahn and then uh, David's lecture. Stefano. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giorgio. So, welcome. Uh, here is uh, actually a a common house together with uh, Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo. Uh, as most of you know, this uh, collegio is uh, it's a joint agreement between the university and the Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo, and, uh, and it's, let me say, a very successful uh, initiative together with the Fondazione that has most, uh, that has all the uh, bank uh, origin, origin bank foundation uh, has a philanthropic, uh, important philanthropic effect uh, on, on the territories. And, and I think that this uh, experience, it's probably one of the best between uh, among the different uh, initiatives that we have, because exactly as you said, uh, brings together uh, the university with the potential of attracting talents of, of the Collegio. And this is really, over the last years, had a, a, a tremendous impact on, uh, on our community, because the, the possibility of the, of the Collegio to generate uh, interest and uh, to attract uh, talents from all over the world, uh, Italy especially, but also many uh, international uh, students uh, and talents and scientists, uh, it's, it's very important for us. So the combination of the two institutions, the, the big university and also very important what we did over the last year to open the, the boundaries behind uh, economics, strictly economics. So uh, a big university, interdisciplinary universities, uh, is our university that this year probably we will touch 90,000 students. We, we are experiencing a tremendous increase, over 25% of students this year in, in counter tendency with the national uh, value that is minus 3%. We are over 20% increase. So the, the university is attractive, but inside this big uh, institution to have uh, an excellence on a specific topic but not so much specific as in the past and, and my, my uh, welcome for the future is to have uh, even uh, a broader uh, field of interest for the institution it's very important for us and just to uh, send uh, and then of course to uh, thank uh, the presence uh, of Professor Card here. We are very honored uh, and uh, very much would like to thank you for uh, for coming, for being here. 
long time, actually a long time, for working here and, and also to give uh, our your uh, speech today in this opening ceremony. And, and the topic that you selected uh, uh, opens to even more uh, fields, so the, the, all the issue of, of immigration, of, uh, and let me say, also health system. I'm, this is my field, so the idea that to guarantee the health, the physical and also the social and economical health of the people is, is the future uh, of the world. We know how much is important, so I look very much forward for your talk and thank you for coming and thank everyone to be here, so many students especially, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the, the next year will be even more rich of, uh, of uh, successes and, uh, and important things uh, uh, even better than the last one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stefano, thank you very much. You're right, I forgot to mention the Compagnia di San Paolo. We wouldn't be here without the Compagnia di San Paolo. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Alberto Anfossi, who is the Secretary General. Of course, he's the other main partner. Work. That's good, thank you very much. I forgot. And uh, of course, uh, David, uh, the topic of your talk is really extremely topical. As you said, as Stefano said, immigration and minimum wages are crucial and a crucial debate in this country. But we are fortunate enough to have Elena Esposito, who is a professor in the Department of the Economics of the University of Torino, who will introduce you, and then we will have your lecture. So, Elena, thank you very much for introducing David. Thank so you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, OK, it's a pleasure for me to be here for introducing you to the lecture of Professor David Card. Um, so I don't know how he, who is in charge of my slide. There's a, um, there's a how do I? Oh, maybe you have the yeah, maybe I have Oh, yeah, easy. Okay. No? Yes. I know, I know you by heart, Professor, so I could do it even without, but uh, <laughs> uh, it helps. So uh, uh, David Card is a class of 1950 professor at the University of Berkeley. Uh, you know that. He's uh, been director of the uh, labor study program at the NBR until 2017, he's been president of the American Economic Association. In 2021, he was awarded in 1995 the, uh, the John Bates Clark Prize in, in, uh, in uh, 1995 by the American Economic Association and the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2021. This says a, a lot, but not does say fully who's David Card for economist. So I try to find a metaphor for those of you outside of economics. Uh, I hope you won't find this inappropriate, Professor. Uh, the, the David Card's papers are like the Beatles songs. They are so deeply rooted in the economist background that just as Beatles songs for rock and roll fans. So see uh, why, why is that? Because David Card pioneered a veritable revolution in economics. Uh, before his path-breaking work and uh, the work of a few other musketeers, I would call them, uh, economics was very much an uh, introspective theoretical science. We had strong theoretical harm, but very weak empirical harm. Uh, we didn't believe data. We didn't believe much our estimates. The problem can be s is simple. We cannot do like in medicine, where you administer economic policy to some like pills. Uh, we cannot do like in physics, where, where you can reproduce economic forces in a lab. So what was the idea of uh, David Card and his colleagues was to uh, look at disruptive um, events that could be used as natural experiments. So it's looking at chance event that could result in some groups being treated and some group not being treated, um, resembling randomized control experiments. The best way to explain natural experiment in class to PhD, master, undergraduate students, uh, partners, family members, is to mention a paper by David Card uh, that inaugurated this way of doing empirics, which changed labor economics first and then all fields in economic. You all probably already know this song by David Card. It's the Mariel Botleaf paper. The idea was, uh, OK, the question is a big question. Is the arrival of immigrants decreasing the way of locals? 
And the conventional wisdom back then was, well, of course it does. It, 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 it does for, for sure. Uh, so the, the empirical evidence was inconclusive. David Carter, the idea to use a, a, a crazy shock to the labor market of Miami in 1980, Fidel Castro unexpectedly allowed all Cubans wishing to do so to leave Cuba. And uh, a big part of them arrived in Miami. Shocks to the labor market, 7% increase in the labor force. Did we see a decrease in wages of local? These papers show that no, we didn't see that. And uh, big controversy emerged. You will talk more today about these findings and subsequent findings. R results were overall confirmed. Um, uh, and still, big controversy emerged, like for your uh, subsequent paper on minimum wages. You, didn't, you seem not to dislike controversies, but uh, um, what happened here? So back then, the question was, uh, is uh, raising the minimum wage would reduce jobs, would cost jobs? And again, the wisdom was based on the theory we had at our disposal back then was, of course, it would. Uh, but again, empirical evidence was inconclusive. So David Carr with his colleague Alan Kruger had the idea of saying, hey, look, uh, New Jersey is raising minimum wage. Let's study what happened comparing uh, two very similar labor market. Uh, labor market in New Jersey where the minimum wages was about to be raised and uh, in Pennsylvania, as in a treatment control group type of setting. Results were very surprisingly, I guess for you as well back then, uh, there was no negative effect of a small raise in the minimum wage. And again, you will tell us today where we stand in, uh, in uh, these trends of research. Okay, I, I, you're here for him, so I'm very happy to leave the floor to David Card. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and uh, um, maybe you should just keep going, Elena. <laughs> I, I think you're going to do a better job than me. Um, and I, I, it's great to be uh, here, and my wife and I have been here for a month. Um, we've uh, had a great visit, as usual, in Torino. Um, we came the first time 20 years ago at the uh, at an invitation from Bruno Contini. Uh, at that time, the Collegio was in um, Mount Cagliari, and we had a, a nice visit then, and we uh, subsequently have visited uh, several times and explored the area. Um, we always enjoy uh, being here and uh, working uh, during the t uh, one of those occasions. I first met Francesco. He came to Berkeley uh, on a sabbatical leave, and uh, we worked on a paper, and we're hoping to uh, reproduce our success. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's really a very nice opportunity. And I especially welcome all the students who've come. I uh, have um, had a lot of students over the years. Um, and uh, I appreciate the, you know, this isn't exactly the kind of thing that every student wants to spend their whole evening doing. So I'll try and be quick. <laughs> um, OK, so um, I, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview about um, a topic that I think is kind of interesting, to, especially perhaps in a, in a more um, uh, uh, level of um, what is exactly economic research doing for the world, um, which is often a question that uh, donors um, and other people outside of economics want to know about. And the starting point for this is the observation, uh, now especially in the United States, um, economists appear to be quite influential. So each of the major agencies has a chief economist. Um, that was something that got started in the late 1980s. Um, some of my friends, um, late Alan Kruger, uh, was the chief economist at the Department of Labor. Um, my friend uh, John Abowd is the chief economist in the Census Bureau now. And so these appear to be very important positions. There's actually a special uh, thing called the Cabinet of Ec uh, Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and if you know anything about politics, you know that you can tell whether an agency is important by how far they are from um, where the, the big people really sit. And the Council of Economic Advisors is actually in the White House. Okay, so that's as top as you can get. Um, and so at the same time as there appears to be some influence, um, there's been a, a lot of progress, I think, in economic knowledge. 
And some of that has been driven by, um, I'd say a lot of it actually has been driven by expanded availability of data. So um, when I first came to visit the Collegio, um, Professor Contini was um, operating a, 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 provided this uh, all new data set using the IMPS data to create longitudinal samples that could be used to follow workers and showed some of the first evidence really in the entire field about how much churning there was and the dynamism of the, of the labor market. And that sort of data has now become widely available for many other um, uh, studies. And um, we've made, I think, a lot of, we've learned a lot. We've, we've found out that a lot of things we thought were true weren't true, uh, which is always good. But at the same time, um, three points I want to you know, make sure everyone realizes. Uh, economic knowledge is still very incomplete. We're, we're nowhere near the level of knowledge that you would have in the, in the natural sciences. Uh, partially that's because econo uh, the economy is always changing and people are always changing. And then there's the other problem I like to explain. Some, some of my friends um, who got PhDs in economics started out in physics. Uh, that's a very common route. I actually was a physicist for a couple of years. I never really got very far in that field. But, um, and the, the key difference between physics and economics is that the particles fight back <laughs> in economics. And so you can have a perfectly good theory about the particles, but they're not necessarily going to follow that theory. Um, it's also uh, the case that economists are very contentious people. So uh, you, you can have what you think is a, a really pro, uh, compelling argument and all the evidence in the world, and there'll be a very large number, perhaps you know 40% of economists who will be fully prepared to dispute every single thing you say. Uh, so you can never really get consensus among economists. And then I think mostly, most importantly, and this is gonna be something I emphasize today in my lecture, is uh, that policy uh, choices and decisions often depend on a lot more than just pure economics. And uh, this, I think, is particularly true in the immigration area. Um, but uh, it's something that we have to keep in mind and realize that um, there's a lot of value in other social sciences and a lot of I input from um, people who are in economics but trying to think about the ways that other people think about uh, the world. So today I'm going to discuss these two examples from really from my own career. Um, starting uh, immigration and minimum wages, as Elena mentioned. And I, to start with, I think we should say, traditionally, um, economists, this, I'm not sure everybody knows this, but it, when I was an undergraduate, uh, which was about a thousand years ago, um, economists liked immigration and disliked minimum wages. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, how, well, how has that changed? Is it, has anything changed? Um, and there, what were the new findings? How did they come about? And uh, to what extent did those new findings influence uh, policy? Um, hmm. Oh, whoops, sorry. That is not good. So let's start with uh, um, the... Uh, this is a slide that um, I, I put up in honor of my old friend, Alan Kruger. Alan always called this the side-by-side. -side. That's where you do the comparison, uh, row by row. And so on the, on the left side, we've got immigration. On the right side, we've got uh, minimum wages. And uh, just going down the list with, on the immigration side, the pluses, well, immigration expands the economy. And uh, if you actually listen to the news, it seems like you know, a bigger economy is good. People don't necessarily think that, that you know, per capita, they think about just the overall size of the economy. Uh, secondly, uh, more immigration uh, for sure is gonna increase the value of land and the capital assets in the economy because it's gonna make those assets more valuable. And there's no better illustration of that than the agricultural sector. So in California, where I live, um, you know, the farms are not really worth much unless you can get the labor in there to actually take the crops off. And so the, uh, that's a very clear case. Uh, on average, believe it or not, the economic theories that were developed all through the uh, 20th century showed that an increase in immigration will tend to increase the average wage of natives. Uh, so for, for the average worker, immigration is, is probably going to be good. The minus uh, about immigration was the concern, and this was really the starting point for my interest in this topic, uh, that lower wages, uh, it would possibly lower wages for the directly competing natives. And in the U.S. context, actually in many countries, this is the case, um, the directly competing natives tend to be closer to the bottom of the distribution, and so you would be particularly concerned about a policy that 
uh, might harm them because, of course, they're facing lots of other harms in the economy, and so that would be something that should get extra weight in the analysis. Uh, minimum wages. Well, the traditional view about minimum wages is basically they're all bad. <laughs> um, reduce employment, uh, reduce incentives for investment, uh, increase consumer prices. Uh, the only plus, and this was often disputed, in fact, the traditional, the most important sort of paper that we all read when I was an undergraduate by George Stigler said this wasn't true, but the traditional view was it was possible that an increase in the minimum wage might raise the incomes of lowest, lower wage workers. It might, it might not, but it might. So that was, the, that was at best the plus you could come up with. Okay, and so it turns out that a lot of my work has really been addressed at sort of these two sides of the uh, two questions that are somewhat related. Uh, one of them is how does immigration affect wages and uh, unemployment and so on for directly competing natives? And on the minimum wage side, how does an increase in, in the minimum wage affect employment of low wage workers? Um, okay, so to understand those views, it's important to realize that they come from a very standard, uh, what we call the supply and demand framework uh, that economists use. Um, now, oftentimes when economists say something is just, or when somebody who's not an economist says that something is supply and demand, it's, um, it's a tautology. It's not really a scientific statement. It's like you can explain anything by supply and demand. Um, so, so what have economists been trying to do over the last uh, 30 years? Well, basically what we've been doing is trying to uh, evaluate those benchmark models and compare the predictions of those models uh, with the empirical evidence. And then, on the other hand, also, uh, when that turned out not to be completely, when the evidence and the theory didn't completely match, there's been a lot of interest in developing or reconsidering alternative theories. And so here's the two headlines for people that um, are, you know, want, getting late in the day, going to fall off asleep or um, start thinking about something else. Um, on the immigration, my wife's down here, so <laughs> this is all she has to remember. Um, the, uh, on the immigration side, I, I hope everybody will remember that Thomas Malthus was wrong. Uh, so the, the usual view that people have about immigration is really a Malthusian view. And I, I do like Malthus, and I have some appreciation of Malthus, but I think in the, in a, using a Malthusian model to analyze a, uh, immigration is not, not right. And on the minimum wage side, there's a similar kind of simple bottom line, and that is in modern economies, employers set wages. Okay, just like producers set prices, employers set wages, unless the minimum wage is binding. And in a lot of labor markets, uh, that's not the case. A lot of most workers, at least in North America, um, very few workers are actually bound by the minimum wage. And so you should think about um, the minimum wage in that context. Okay, so let's go through the immigration case. Most people, so I talked to a lot of journalists uh, over the years, and it's almost always, in their mind, very straightforward how the labor market works. They have in mind a model like a, a, my old friend John DiNardo used to call it the skating rink model. So you've got a skating rink. This is something that's very important to Canadians. It's a, like ice, okay? And there's, um, there's room for, uh, you know, 50 people on the, on the ice. An immigrant comes in, then somebody has to go out, kind of like the rules of soccer or football, right? If, if technically, when somebody comes in, somebody else has to leave. And um, so more people means there's going to be lower wages or lower opportunities for the others. And this was an idea proposed by Malthus in 1826. He was thinking, he had evidence, actually, empirical evidence. Uh, it turned out that after the um, Great Death in the uh, 13th century, uh, wages went up quite a bit throughout Western Europe. So although it was a terrible period, the fact that so many people died improved conditions for the remaining people. And the way that happened was that the, the margin of cultivation pulled back. So instead of having to try and farm in Scotland, <laughs> where my ancestors are from, uh, you could move back down to England where it was a little bit warmer and you get a little bit higher crop yield. Um, now the, the sort of difficulty that that sort of story faces right away is the fact that larger countries uh, don't have lower incomes. Uh, larger cities inside of a country don't have lower wages. In fact, larger cities almost inevitably have much higher wages. So there's something going on offsetting this Malthusian effect. Uh, and, in, and indeed, some countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand actually encourage immigration. They don't discourage it, or at least they, they will until the, you know, there's probably going to be an election in those countries eventually too. 
So um, what was going on? Well, Malthus was thinking about a medieval world with agriculture, and in that setting, there's a fixed set of things that in the, uh, the population can work with. But in a modern economy, the 20th century economists realized, early 20th century economists realized, that you can avoid the Malthusian trap if you can increase capital investment. So most people don't farm, they work with tools and machinery, buildings, infrastructure. And as long as we can expand the supply of tools, machinery, and infrastructure, we can accommodate virtually any population. And in fact, um, there's a lot of economic models, models of, ec uh, of modern economic growth, for instance, the model that um, um, Paul Romer was awarded the Nobel Prize for a few years ago, says that a larger economy probably is a little bit more efficient because there's a little bit of a gain from having a larger group of people, a little bit more incentives for investment, a little bit more creativity and so on. Now, the, the, even in that model, with uh, capital investment keeping pace with population, it can be the case if immigrant inflows are non-diversified that there can be a negative effect on, on natives. And so the research agenda in the immigration literature over the last 30 years has been, first of all, asking how do we measure diversity of immigrants? Uh, and then secondly, what do we know about these groups that are most similar to na uh, the immigrants in terms of the big picture um, uh, flows and impacts? So the, for the most part, economists have been thinking about measuring diversity of immigrants by education groups. And so I'll, be, I'll show a little bit about that. And uh, the big picture story, now this is a slide that I prepared for a talk in the United States. In the United States, um, one third of the population have a bachelor's degree or higher. And the share of immigrants coming to the United States with a bachelor's degree or higher is exactly one third. So in fact, Immigrants as a whole have the same education distribution as natives at that broad level. That's not what you think when you read the paper uh, or you get in a taxi in Washington, D.C., because you say, well, that's, you think that's where all the immigrants are. But if you go to other places, there's many cities in the United States where the immigrants are actually better educated than the natives. So in a lot of places, all the doctors are immigrants uh, rather than the natives, so the, and, and a lot of all the professors. So that's a, that, there, there's kind of a misleading impression. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a picture, uh, uh, data. This is going to be one of, I don't have that many tables. Um, my wife always likes to make fun of the fact that uh, as a co labor economist, I can be endlessly fascinated by tables of digits. Uh, so this is my first table of digits. Uh, this is the percent of immigrants in each of these education buckets and then the share of the workforce. And here you can see very clearly kind of something that everybody sort of knows, that half of all immigrants in the US, I'm, I'm looking at this slide right, oh, I made it, look at that. Right there, that one. Half of all immigrants in the US have less than a high school education. So that is very low level of education by US standards. But that's only 2% of the workforce, okay? So that's not a huge impact on the labor market. Um, the rest of immigrants are distributed across the distribution. And if you look at the level, once you get to a uh, bachelor's degree, master's degree, or PhD, then uh, these, these are higher than, remember the average uh, in the United States as a whole, about 14% of the labor force is immigrant. So half the people with less than eight years of education are immigrants, but 22% with PhDs. So us PhD types are actually overrepresented. I'm an immigrant myself, so I'm kind of in this pool. We're only 3% as well. So there's, a, there's some diversity there. In fact, immigrants are kind of set at the top and the bottom of the distribution, not so much in the middle. If you take a deep dive and look, and this is an important topic for uh, immigration policy, especially going forward, I think, which has to do with STEM. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's uh, a really important um, source of techno tech sector and so on. Um, the STEM sector, 21%, uh, uh, this is the share of bachelor degree people in the United States that are in the STEM subjects, only a 20%. And that, that's actually lower than it would be probably in Italy. I think there's probably a higher fraction of people with engineering background in Italy. Uh, at the master's degree, 34%. Uh, excuse me, this is the immigrant share. So this, the 21% the, the of all bachelor degree are immigrant. Uh, 
34% of all master's degree are immigrant and 31% of all PhDs are immigrant. If we look at computer science or engineering, you can see this very stark difference. So almost half of the people with PhDs in computer science or engineering in the United States are immigrants. So this is a really important, this is economics, we're kind of fairly similar across the education distribution, about 20% of, our, of, our, of us are uh, um, immigrants. So you can see this is very important for um, the, those sectors that are heavily demanding computer scientists. So what about the evidence on diversity? Well, um, we can see that immigrants are concentrated at the high end and the low end, but overall the college share is about the same for immigrants as it is for natives. So that means probably any effect of immigration is going to be pretty small. Okay? But it, there might be some effect on two groups. It, immigration could possibly lower the wages of the lowest educated and the PhDs. And most of the work has actually been focused on the lower educated. So how do we get credible evidence on this? Well, Elaine already mentioned um, one way that you can do this. And that's uh, what I call the big, big shock idea. So with, with, um, with a big shock to a small labor market like Miami, as, as Elena pointed out, you can potentially devise a treatment group, control group kind of strategy. So in my study many, many years ago, what I did was I compared what had happened in Miami to what had happened in a set of four other cities, which in the 10 years before the Marial boat lift had kind of acted the same on average as Miami. So that was the way I defined my comparison group. Um, and this is a graph showing what happened to wages in Miami. Miami is the um, blue line. And in what I call synthetic Miami, that's the combination of the four other cities that kind of acted like Miami. And you can see a couple of things. First of all, um, wages were trending down in the United States, especially in Miami in this period. That's a kind of a sad fact about the US, during the 70s, real wages fell, and they actually still have just barely recovered to the level they were at the late 70s in the US. Um, that means if you just looked at wage levels, you might say, oh, this immigration was killing us, it was hurting us. But if you compare Miami to the comparison cities, it doesn't do much different, and that, that's true after the boat lift, which occurs in, around the green line here. So that's the nature of the evidence, extremely simple evidence. Uh, and I've always been surprised that that paper had any impact. I, I actually, <laughs> wrote it and sent it to a very minor journal. It got accepted. I never really thought that it would be as uh, popular as it turned out to be. Um, there's been a lot of follow-up studies. Uh, probably one of the most interesting is the mass exodus of uh, Jews from Russia after Russia fell apart in 1991, creating this massive inflow to Israel. Uh, but there was other ones. There was the end of the Algerian War and the Angolan War, which both created big flows back to France and Portugal. And in all of these cases, surprisingly, that looks like the Marielle boat lift experience was uh, reproduced, so there wasn't much evidence, even in the case of Israel, where there was this massive shock. A second way that people have tried to study immigration is by looking at enclaves. Um, so Italians are kind of, there's a lot of Italian immigrants, or there were a lot of Italian immigrants in, in the United States. There are some Italian enclaves, but they're a little bit more spread out than most other immigrant groups, believe it or not, because uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of cities that have a significant Italian population. But a lot of other cities are very much focused. So Cubans all go to Miami, Polish immigrants all go to Chicago, Filipino immigrants, which is a very large group of immigrants in the US, they go to cities that had naval bases, because after World War II, there was a special exemption from immigration law for Filipinos if they came and worked in a naval base. That's all the history of the Pacific Fleet and the fact that the, when they took over from Japan, they retook the Philippines from Japan, there was basically a lot of Filipino workers that were needed to maintain the fleet. And so with that idea, you can say, when there's going to be a lot of people leaving, my aunt, excuse me, leaving Cuba, we know where they're going to go. So if Fidel Castro opens the doors in Cuba, they are going to go mostly to Miami. And we can... Similarly, if a lot of Poles leave, as they did in 1991 and 92, they're mostly going to go to Chicago. Um, if people come from Lebanon and Syria, they're going to go to Detroit. Okay? Even though Detroit is a terrible labor market, there's just a long, long history of immigration to that area, so that's where they end up. And so you can predict on that basis where immigrants are going to go, even though it's indep independent of the economic conditions in that city. And that's an idea that I used uh, in a couple of different studies. 
And this is an example of what you tend to find there. It's a little bit hard to, to understand if you're not used to reading graphs, but what it shows on the x-axis is the predicted relative inflow of immigrants to different cities. And the relative inflow is the relative share of highly educated to less highly educated immigrants. And, and then this is what's happening to the uh, wage of the same groups of natives. And what you'd expect if there was a lot of competitive effect is that when there's a lot of movement along the x-axis in this direction, so more relative inflow of one type of lower educated immigrants, then there's going to be depression in the wages. You'd expect a downward sloping curve. But instead, you don't get that. What about the longer run? Now, the longer run effect of immigration is extremely interesting. Um, there's two comparisons that I often think about. Um, uh, one that comes to mind to all Canadians is Montreal versus Toronto. If you've been to Canada, you will know that Mont uh, Toronto is a very unusual city. It's one of those cities that's over 50% immigrants. It's like Los Angeles and London. Uh, and why, on the other hand, Montreal has only about uh, 7 or 8% immigrants, which is quite low by Canadian standards. Why is that? Well, uh, back in the 70s, the, the uh, Quebec language laws were introduced, and it forced all immigrants who came to Quebec to learn French first and go to French schools. And uh, over the period since 1970, most of the new immigrants coming to Canada are coming from Asia. And a good chunk of those Asian immigrants already speak English, and another chunk of them think that they're going to move to Canada and then their children are going to move to the United States, which is actually true. So they want to learn English. <laughs> and uh, as a result, basically, they completely diverted Montreal and gone to Toronto. And it's had a huge effect. And I have to say, in my view, made a huge positive impact on Toronto in many, many ways besides economically. It's made a huge effect economically, but also culturally. It used to be a pretty bad place to live, because I happen to know because I grew up there. Uh, okay, now there's a really interesting uh, new example of this. Uh, Antonio Ciccone and Jan Nimchuk have a paper, very new paper, looking at what happened after World War II. Remember, uh, after World War II, West Germ Germany was all divided up into parts, and there was the parts controlled by different of the allies. And it turned out, as the, the people were coming from former Poland and that part of the world back to Germany, because they were kind of reorganizing after the war, there was a massive flow of refugees and the part of Germany that was controlled by the French didn't accept them. The French didn't want to have any of those uh, people come. So they instead mostly went to the American sector. And there's a line. It follows one of the major highways. And you, these guys show that there's a really sharp difference. The cities on the American sector side are today much richer than those on the French side. They're bigger, they have more vibrant populations, and they're richer. And it seems, they argue pretty strongly, I think, that that is because that extra population actually in the long run benefited those cities. Okay, so the side-by-side -side on immigration, or the uh, tally on immigration, it looks like um, this sort of concern about the lower wages for, low, uh, for um, directly competing natives may not be such a major concern. Not to say there isn't some situations where that happens, but it doesn't look like it's a first-order concern. What's the policy reaction? Well, on this front, I think we can say economics has failed. Because uh, in the US, for example, immigration policies tightened after 9-11 very sharply. There was a massive change in policy after 9-11. And then, uh, under the Trump administration, another serious clampdown that hasn't really been reversed. So right now, uh, the caps on highly skilled immigrants who come in under the so-called H-1B program are very binding. And if you know anybody who, a, a student who's thinking about going to the United States, they'll know that this is actually pretty difficult these days. Refugees, basically the United States doesn't accept refugees anymore. It had a very tiny number of refugees. So the conclusion is that this, this change didn't really affect, all this new knowledge didn't really affect uh, immigration policy very much. And in other work I've done with Christian Dussman and Ian Preston, we looked at why this could be. And we decided that, based on a lot of different evidence that I'd be glad to talk about in question and answer if people are interested, that concerns that people have about immigration aren't really driven by uh, economic concerns. They're really driven by concerns about what the population will look like. Sort of what you say is people don't want to have a population around them that looks a lot different than it did when they were kids. So everybody wants to grow up in a more or less where they, or have their environment more or less like it was when they were kids. And so they're very concerned about admitting people of a different religion, a different racial group, uh, 
different language, and all of those things basically compete against any economic benefit of immigration. What about minimum wages? Um, well, the backstory on this is that, you know, the theoretical framework is that minimum wages are, were thought to be very bad by sort of the neoclassical framework, but it, it, it should be pointed out that in 1933, which is a very long time ago, uh, a famous economist named Joan Robinson showed that that wouldn't be the case if employers set wages. If employers set wages, a minimum wage could kind of solve some of the problem that, the minim that employers tended to keep wages a little bit too low. And so that won't necessarily go on forever. Obviously, you can't raise the, way, the minimum wage forever and have a positive effect. Um, and there's a good intuition about it. Um, actually, when Alan Kruger and I did our study of fast food restaurants in New Jersey, before we did that study, we went out and actually did some, you know, we went to a few fast food restaurants. <laughs> and and we, they, we noticed at the time that they were all trying to hire workers. And we asked, well, the managers, to the extent we could, we said, well, why don't you just raise wages? And they all basically said the same thing, not exactly in the same way an economist would say it, but they all said, you know, I've got some people working for me now. If I was to post a higher wage, I'd have to pay that to the people I already have. And so increasing the wage is going to give me probabilistically more workers, but it's also going to cost me a lot more than just the wage on that one worker. It's going to cost me a lot on all the other workers I have. And that's the source of what's called monopsony power. So credible evidence on this? Well, big shocks. Um, there were some studies in the, in the 1920s and 30s and even into the 40s about uh, minimum wages looking at the textile sector that was newly covered by the federal minimum wage in the US. Uh, Alan and I had the same idea uh, looking at New Jersey and Pennsylvania. What, what our big advance, and this is actually, again, an extremely simple, modest paper. Our big advance was to have a control group. We said, okay, let's not just study what happened in New Jersey, but we need to have another place where that, the minimum wage didn't, didn't, didn't happen. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of better papers, much better papers than our paper, uh, looking at other kinds of evidence. Um, there's many studies that look at uh, increases in the minimum wage state by state, comparing like when Illinois has a minimum wage increase and Missouri doesn't, or when uh, Florida had a minimum wage increase and Georgia didn't. And so uh, that's a pretty compelling set of studies. There's two really interesting national studies. The UK introduced a minimum wage in 1995, and then in 2015, Germany introduced a national minimum wage. It's 2015, this is a mistake here. Um, and that was pretty unusual for the, Ger for the German situation. They had never had a minimum wage ever, and it was quite controversial. Uh, and one good thing about, the, especially the German case, they have amazing data. They now have imps-like data, so the social security records for all the employees in the economy, where they work, what they're paid, what occupation they have. And so you can actually study the effect of something like the minimum wage in great detail much better than Alan and I could with the New Jersey case. And the studies really show, much to the chagrin of a, of a lot of economists who thought that this minimum wage would be a really bad idea in the German context, that it had more or less the same kind of effects we found in, in, um, in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania study. Um, so on the, on the minimum wage side, we see that this concern about the employment effect of, of minimum wages is probably, again, overstated. On the other hand, uh, that's not to say that some of these other concerns aren't still present. The new research is consistently showing evidence that raising the minimum wage causes prices to go up. So there's definitely a price effect. Uh, it shows that there's a very positive effect on wages for low wage workers and even for workers who earn a little bit more than the minimum wage. So a minimum wage probably has a distributional effect. So what about the policy reactions to that line of research? Well, I would say there, uh, initially, the reaction was pretty negative. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, this is a guy who won the Nobel Prize some time ago, um, James Buchanan. And he was um, pretty outraged that Alan Kruger and I um, got our paper published in the American Economic Review. And he was really outraged when I won the John Bates Clark Award. And so this is what he said. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that basically uh, any claim that uh, increases the minimum wage, increase employment, is equivalent to denial that there's even minimal scientific content in economics. Now, what's weird about that is that Joan Robinson's theory was on the table. He knew about that theory, okay, because he had a PhD from Chicago and they used to teach it. 
so he, so he, it was sort of like saying, well, that theory is so bad that you can't even propose it as a scientific matter. I don't know. Anyway, I've never quite understood. Um, but it, luckily, my mother never saw this quote because there, there was actually more to it than that. <laughs> okay, so about 10 years or 15 years after Alan and I did our work, there started to be uh, more policy reaction. In the US, uh, many states adopted, have adopted minimum wages. The federal minimum wage is stuck, but the, many states have, have increased their minimum wages. Then Germany uh, has done what they've done, and a bunch of other European countries, including Hungary and others, have, have done something. So I think uh, we can now say, at least when the minimum wage is at the levels it is in the United States. Now that is, does not mean it doesn't, it's the same evidence and the same pattern for other settings. But at that, in that setting, the concern over job loss is probably not the main issue. There can be a big concern about minimum wages because it does reduce profits. Okay? So if you're concerned about long-term profitability, that could be a concern. Uh, and that's something that I think uh, is still, people are still working on. So my conclusions, and this is my last slide, uh, I think that we now know quite a bit more about these two policies uh, in terms of their economic effects. The state of the art in analyzing them is to take advantage of these massive new data sets and fairly simple research designs which get, try and get you closer and closer to an experimental setting. Um, it has caused economists to update their models and the way they think about immigration and minimum wages, and uh, I think we've made some progress in that, and there's a lot of new work coming out, especially on wage setting, that's pretty interesting. I think research has possibly influenced a little bit um, the minimum wage policy area, but it's probably not influenced the immigration literature uh, policy area very much at all, because in that case, I think the real issue was not the economic one. So I think we have to be modest as economists and realize that we can learn a lot. Uh, our knowledge isn't necessarily going to change things overnight. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's worthless. It's always important that we know things and that we understand the market better. And the, the other thing I would say is that um, it's possible that you know, going forward, there's going to be lots and lots of opportunities to think about other settings where there's uh, new data and new methods that can try and uh, illuminate other problems in the future. So I think that overall, this is a great time for economics and economic research. So I'll stop there. David, really, thank you very much for a very clear and very insightful lecture. I think you touched uh, many, I mean, at least two really crucial issues in uh, economic policies today and very, very hotly debated. And what is interesting is that, uh, as you said, even though you know, a lot of evidence have been built up uh, in the last 20 years, these issues are still very controversial and very debated. So somehow it's hard even for very strong economic argument and well, well very well thought out theories and empirical evidence to, to win the day and really to manage to really uh, push policies in the right direction. So I think that really what you said today was really very insightful and very important. So I'm sure there will be questions from the floor. Uh, who wants to start? Yes, we have a question there. I think there is a microphone coming. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Sorry, just to, it's nice that yeah. if you say. Nice to meet questions you. Questions will be in English. I mean, I think we will have. I have a translation. If we but you, you, you can have yeah. it in English. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you, Matteo Vazé from Turin, passionate about innovation and social impact. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, listening to you, maybe pointing the example of immigration uh, of people like Sergio Marchionne or Steve Jobs or even, I don't know, people are very rich, maybe sometimes. I think about John Elkan who lives burning in New York but come back in Turin. He's kind of immigrants, I don't know, I don't think. Uh, I, I appreciate a lot your point of view. How can you, uh, I don't know, help me to, to see the word uh, differentiating uh, about the, the, the money I have. If I want to go to Monte Carlo, I, have, I need to have one million euro and I can receive the the license to live there. 
Um, what, what do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, actually, that's an old idea in economics. Um, the idea that you would sell the slots, basically. Um, and there's a certain, it, it has a very strong appeal to a, you know, old fashioned economists. Actually, uh, my old friend Richard Freeman at, at Harvard University, who's a pretty liberal labor economist, has proposed this many times. Um, and his proposal was something like people could move to a country, and if, they, if you thought that there was some uh, potential cost when they come, like they might impose some cost on the economy, you could ask them either to pay up front or to be willing to pay in the future over some installment plan, kind of the way we think about investing in college. So he thought about it like I should be able to go to the United States and invest in it like I would pay to go to a, high, a higher cost college. Um, I think the problem with it is it, uh, we, we run into immediate difficulty with the distributional side, right? If you think about like a lot of immigrants are refugees, they're already in extremely bad circumstances. And probably even if things go well for them, in their lifetimes, actually this has been true um, for immigration in the United States for many, many years, not hundreds of years. Most immigrants are never very well off. It's their children who are well off. There's a few superstars and things like that, but the typical Ameri uh, immigrant to the United States is doing okay, not necessarily great, but their children do extremely well. Their children, the, the so-called second generation are the most highly educated people in the country and also in many ways the most successful. And so in a way you might say, kind of like what they, the kind of mortgage they have in Japan because houses are so expensive, you pass the mortgage on to your children, you say, okay, I'm gonna move to the United States and my children are gonna pay the bill. <laughs> now, you could say that actually that's what we're doing with the tax system. Because we have a progressive tax system, maybe not progressive enough, but because we have a progressive tax system, in fact, uh, second generation success does pay for previous immigration, if you thought there was a cost there. And if you're extremely successful as an immigrant and have high income, you do pay higher taxes. And so when people do these analyses of who pays what taxes, immigrants always look really good. The reason why is because they come as adults mostly, so they're already done their education. And a lot of their healthcare costs, you only have two places where you cost a lot of money in the healthcare system, when you're born and when you die. So they've already, we've already saved the money on their birth and their education. Okay, and we get them when they're productive. And you're, if, if we're really lucky, they go home afterwards and live on somebody else's <laughs> uh, health insurance system. But in any case, I think, so if you do a, a cost benefit, my um, colleague, friend, uh, Christian Dusman has done this with Britain, very detailed uh, kind of accounting, which suggests that in the British context where the best data is available, it looks like immigrants are a really good bargain. But that, again, that doesn't have any effect on the political debate. Uh, for the very same reasons I talked about, yeah. yeah that, that is a very cost-benefit analysis, really very of immigrants in terms of also of, of, of public money. I think it's a really crucial issue to debate. Now, I have a question here that I want to put to you because it's from my supervisor at Oxford, Frances Stewart, that I haven't seen for a long time, so I'm very happy she's putting a question here, Frances. So she says that given that the profit share has been rising, and the investment share has not, uh, has not in fact. Uh, may, well, does the, then does the impact on profits that you have shown in your discussion matter in a positive way? So the idea is that essentially the fact that minimum wage reduces profits, maybe this is a strong incentive for higher investments or not. Interesting. Um. The problem with the, um, that kind of uh, analysis, it's, it's something that maybe someone could come up with a way to, to study, but it's essentially a macroeconomic argument. It's sort of saying, on average, in the economy as a whole, uh, profits have gone up as a share of GNP, and therefore we could introduce a policy to possibly eat away at those profits. Uh, and that might be actually efficiency improving. But the problem is it's a macro idea, and so I don't think it's easy to come up with a control group. <laughs> so that's not my kind of question. <laughs> I'm a control group guy. Um, 
but uh, I think it's, poten it's, it's theoretically an interesting idea. It's the same, you know, w once you have an economy with, with um, distortions in wage setting for whatever reason, or then potentially a lot of the simplest ideas that economists have that they teach in economics one don't work. Now, everybody who has a more advanced training knows that, but the popular discussion often focuses on this very low, simplest, oversimplified world. Yeah. yeah. Also because probably the profit share has been mostly rising in, in superstar firms, so firms that have a very high concentration of market shares and which essentially probably are not those that would be paying minimum wages. Well, it's, probably. Possible, it's possible that, uh, that this year that's going to change. I think like Facebook, for instance, is not, <laughs> not doing so well. So it's possible that some of those, you know, very hotly discussed profit numbers were possibly kind of a transitory phenomenon. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, there, please. Microphone. Hi, I'm Jennifer McCoy. I'm also a visiting researcher um, here at Collegio this fall, from, also from the United States. But I'm a political scientist, so I really appreciated, David, your talking about confounding factors, um, including um, the status and, and the way people are, you know, may have other kinds of concerns and fears about immigration. And particularly with political polarization, which I believe is a strong confounding factor, we have a hard time getting evidence such as that you're producing to be believed by a number of, you know, by the population and also in the policy sector. So I'm curious about your impressions about to what extent is there a consensus now among economists um, on this kind of evidence? You said many economists are updating their models, but is there still a strong, you know, James Buchanan wing over there um, or is there a strong consensus? And if so, are they participating in these policy arenas like the Council of Economic Advisors uh, or uh, those advising politicians? Uh, because the messenger really matters. And so this is, this is our problem I get about getting this information out to people. The same for Italy. Um, I think the concerns about immigration and refugees coming from Northern Africa, how you know, it's a question of how to impart the information. And as kind of experts or academics often were not listened to, but given the strong role that economists play in the policy arena and advising corporations, politicians, you know, I think that they could have a very strong role at that, at that level advising. But I'm not sure to what extent there's a consensus among them, or are people getting conflicting advice on these issues, these policy issues that you're working on? Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, that's, I, I think that, um, I, I would say when I said that there's, you know, more agreement with the sort of the evidence that I, I, I wouldn't say that um, it's probably among the younger economists, uh, more than half are kind of thinking about things in, in slightly newer ways. But many of the older economists haven't changed their views. Um, you know, that's sort of how science goes. You have to kill off all the old ones before you get any, <laughs> anything new. And not always, of course. But, um, but uh, and uh, so, and who's giving advice? I think that's actually an illustration of, of, the, of a general point. So when, when, when the Trump administration came in, they were not, they did not, they had a few people advising them on immigration, for instance. Uh, and very, probably a very small minority of economists would have agreed with their position, but there are some. Um, and so they didn't have any trouble finding people who could, you know, write what looked like scholarly papers saying that what they did made sense. Yeah, it's easy to do that. Um, and I think that a general problem in, in this sort of polarized setting and maybe particularly in the United States is a very uh, deep suspicion about what sort of elite people are prescribing for everyone else. 
And I think some of that is our, our fault. So, you know, um, the average person with a PhD has a fairly good life. They don't get unemployed. They don't have health crises. They don't lose um, their, you know, their, their house when there's a downturn. Uh, and so they are oftentimes, I think, not very sensitive to the pro set of problems that are for, at the front of mind for the bottom half of the income distribution. And I think that comes across very clearly. And it's a risk that, that a, a more liberal administration has that all of their advisors appear to be uh, extremely well off and concerned about the, you know, sort of the, the top half or top tenth of the income distribution. Um, so I think it has been a weakness uh, probably of the, of the, even of the Democrat side to really appear not to be concerned about the problems of, the, of lower income people. Uh, as much. And so this kind of feeds into that. Concern. Now, minimum wage is a little harder to explain because arguably minimum wage, most low wage people are in favor of minimum wages. And in fact, a lot of states, even conservative southern states, have passed minimum wage increases, like Florida has a fairly high minimum wage, even though it's pretty conservative. Immigration, though, I think is is, is more one of these issues that's very easy to polarize and it's hard to see how the advice of somebody like me is not going to be that compelling, especially the fact that I'm an immigrant myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Elsa Fornero, the, the microphone is arriving. So first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. I think uh, good data and good interpretation of good data are really there to make people change their mind. And uh, so I was wondering whether you see a similarity between the topics uh, that you have chosen, migration and uh, minimum wage, a similarity between these two uh, topics and the resistance to women work in many countries, meaning uh, women employment in many countries. I mean, there is a position still there that women take away jobs from men or reduce uh, wages, uh, average wages. And uh, since, uh, uh, well, we have even, uh, let's say, uh, a very superficial uh, aggregate data that shows that uh, Northern European countries where women normally work at a rate uh, just equal to men, this has not happened. Uh, so why is it that uh, we still have such a resistance to women works in many countries? I'm getting all the easy questions. <laughs> um, I think that's this is typical. Elsa always gives very easy questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. Um, there is um, a lot of evidence that perceptions about women working and the role, like the role of women in income generation and who should be earning the money and all that, is very strongly culturally determined. So there's studies. In the United States, for instance, you can take um, immigrants from different countries. And you can see, now they're all in the same environment, and you can see, um, do immigrants from Sweden and Norway, do the wives work a lot more than immigrants from Mexico? Or, or say, hold constant income and take immigrants from, uh, from Italy versus um, uh, Norway. And in fact, there's very big differences. So it looks like a lot of that is determined by what economists always call preferences, which means it's something that people have made a choice on the basis of independent of the kind of constraints that they're facing. Um, but there is other evidence that I think that uh, the institutional factors do matter. And a lot of countries uh, are trying to make adjustments. And this is becoming particularly important in the low uh, population growth countries. So Japan, for instance, has had a historically extremely low participation of women and has introduced over the last 20 years a, a quite a large change in availability of childcare and in flexibility for employers to allow people to go away and come back to work after a, a year or two. 
Uh, and it's start, it has smaller effects than people had hoped, but it is definitely having some effect. And then the new generation of Japanese women are much more likely to want to stay working than their mothers and grandmothers did. So Japan is actually, if you look at it, it's surprising, but it's actually making significant progress uh, with a combination of changes in views and institutional factors. Um, and I think some other countries are changing. There's, there's a lot of interesting research. Um, there's really great research design from, from Switzerland where you've got the German cantons and the French cantons. And the, in the German cantons, employment rate of women is much, much lower than it is in the French cantons, even though the laws are virtually the same. So there's definitely lots of possibilities for study and maybe research, but it's not, it's not an area that I know. M many of my students work in this area because it's very topical, but I, it's not one that I've worked on myself. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Professor Giuseppe De Arcangelis, who is at the University of Rome, who is actually a trade economist. And so he is wondering whether there is a Rybczynski effect in the fact that, uh, in the, no, in the, the fact that large inflows of low skilled immigrants don't depress wages. And the Rybczynski effect is essentially a supply shock when you have a large. Uh, change in the endowments of factors of production. For example, you have a large inflows of immigrants. The Ripchinsky theorem says that this increases actually the uh, returns for that group of, for that factor of production for that group of workers. So right. is that the case? So can you elaborate a little more on what is the cause of the, the reason why there is no effect? Yeah, I, I, I can say. Um, so this, this idea is the following idea. Um, there's a sort of a, a lower skilled job which requires um, people without much education and a high skilled job that requires people with education. Immigrants come in, low, suppose low skilled immigrants come in, then that, that business that, uh, that can use the low skilled workers expands and exports what they're producing. Now, the problem in the United States, this has been studied by several of my PhD students um, many times, um, and the problem for the United States is many of the lower skilled jobs are local service jobs. So, uh, but there is an export component. For instance, the tourism business is an export industry, if you think about it that way. And so we are able to increase the supply of restaurants and accommodation and hotels and stuff and in fact, you can see that pressure in the, in the even in, in the Italian labor market, you, like everybody's complaining about not getting enough workers for the hotel business in Rome. Um, so there's definitely a component of that. Uh, but whether you can count on that reliably is a good question. Like in other words, if you have a lot of workers available of a certain skill group, can you get investment to move in that direction and increase the demand? And more generally, we have, I think, a problem in a lot of places in the world where there seems to be available good workers, and yet there doesn't seem to be strong interest by employers in investing in those areas. And one of the big puzzles around the world is how to solve these depressed areas like southern Italy, um, Appalachia in the United States, uh, certain regions of Australia that are deeply depressed and seem to be disconnected from the rest of the economy. And to the extent that they're surviving, they're surviving by many people leaving those regions rather than by thriving. And so it's a, I think that's a top agenda item for economic research in the future. Thank you very much. Who has other question? Okay. No other question from the floor. Yes, one from the back there. I present myself. I'm a PhD student at the first year here at Collegio. I would like to uh, ask you uh, whether, uh, what, what do you think about uh, what are the main issues related to causality literature? Uh, what, what are the, the, the most important challenges uh, for new economist generations? And uh, uh, what are the main limitations of actual econometric techniques? Uh, and their uh, cause, cause, causal, uh, uh, the problem related to causality, for instance, uh, to external validity. 
So uh, what, what are the, the most important roles to be, to be taken in this, uh, with this respect? Right. Um, so there's something really interesting going on in this area. Causality is the idea that we have, everybody knows that you, when you even take like a, a high school class in data or statistics or something, they'll say correlation is not causality. They'll say, you know, A and B move together, but A didn't cause B, B didn't cause A, there's some underlying force. And causality is, a, is an attempt to sort that out, and that's what these natural experiments do, and that's what a lab experiment does. Um, there's a lot, for years and years, statisticians and computer scientists completely ignored the issue of causality, because it wasn't really their thing. Um, and that's changed quickly. So now there's a huge branch of computer scientists working on how to... Um, infer causality with, uh, with very complicated observational data of the kind that's being generated from uh, you know, internet interactions with e-commerce, e for instance, at Amazon or uh, whatever. And uh, so I think that the forefront in this area is gonna be, and it turns out a lot of economists are involved in that. I think the forefront is gonna be economists and computer scientists working together. And it, it, computer scientists are incredibly clever at coming up with, um, really uh, efficient ways to process massive amounts of data and tweak out just a tiny little bit of signal from something. And that's the problem that you face in, in a causal story. The, the kind of exercise I was presenting here, you saw my graph of Miami, those lines are kind of going like this, and if you stare at it, you might be able to see something. And what they're trying to do is say, suppose I have, you know, I did some ex analysis last night and on the data that we were selling at different prices in different parts of the country. We had one million transactions. Can I sort out causality? And that's going to be the frontier, I think, going forward. Yes. Um, here there is another question about from Judith Heyer, always from Oxford. We've got a lot of questions from Oxford today. Oh. And Judith is asking, uh, if whether economists can do better in getting the economic arguments across, in the sense that uh, this is a, you, you answered a little, you already dealt with these questions before a little bit, but maybe you want to elaborate a little more if we can be somehow more effective in getting good ideas across. And this is, I think, it's a crucial issue today. Uh, I think that uh, having this type of the, the meetings and conversation and discussions and lectures like yours is a good way of trying to take these good ideas across, but maybe it's not enough. What can we do on that? I think it's a crucial issue today. So I had an idea on this, actually. Um, I was thinking about take two sets of ideas that came around and let's take the one, like one that became popular and one that didn't and try and understand like what, what was the cause. So try and do like a study of what works. Um, and I honestly have no real idea. My deep suspicion is that a lot of research in the social sciences, it becomes accepted at a point in time if it's kind of the right story for that time. So think of Keynes. Keynes came along with a story that said we need to do something, you know, increase government revenue. And then after World War II, kind of did it. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> and so Keynes became very popular. Uh, and so, but maybe that's, you know, there, there's people who say that the Keynesian ideas about um, a depressed economy and, and spending and so on were around before. Vixel apparently had the same ideas but it really didn't catch on. So I think it's possible that ideas, like I would say the work that Kruger and I did on minimum wages and the whole book we wrote, arguably had no effect for at least five to 10 years until people got around to the point where they wanted to raise the minimum wage and then somebody said, well, we better find some evidence. <laughs> so it's possible that it looks like we had an effect, but it's reverse. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case, to tell you the truth. Because I, I can tell you frankly, Alan and I wrote this book and, it act, and we got an advance on the book sales and we've never actually sold as many books as they thought we would, even to this day. <laughs> so, but afterwards you did. No, no, no we didn't. No, no, no. Okay. So, uh, so it, 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 you know, I wouldn't say that it was a, you know, it was a big success. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, everybody knows about Vilfredo Pareto. He didn't sell any books, right? It was kind of like the... Um, he, he was like, like you know, famous artists who have no paintings sold, like Van Gogh, right? No, nobody bought any of his paintings. I think. So I, I think we have to be very modest about that. But it's something we could study. 
Yeah, but I think there is also a major, very important issue. I think we have anyway, and particularly institutions have a very important role in uh, in diffusing idea, in making ideas simpler. No, sometimes economists and social scientists they tend to speak to themselves. No. And uh, you know it's really a, a closed circle of people that talk to each other and publish journals, very complicated articles. To essentially working on dissemination, I think it's crucial, and this is what we want to do. I had a final question for you, and uh, it's really about again about what we do here. I mean, here what we try to do is really to attract brains to Turin and to Italy, in the sense that the Collegio is really very forceful to, goes into to the international job market to attract very bright assistant professor and also not only assistant professor, also more senior people to come here to Turin and to enter gradually into the University of Turin. And for us, this is very important, no? And I think if you're looking at the data of immigrants in Italy, immigrants in Italy, Italy probably is the country that has the largest share of low-skill immigrants coming to Italy compared to other European countries. And this also reflects partly the distribution of the popu Italian native population in terms of education. You know, Italy has a, has a, has a very low share of, uh, of, uh, of a very high share of low-educated people. So essentially, I believe that what we do here to try to attract more highly educated immigrants is maybe is, is an exercise to move a little bit the composition, to change a little bit the composition of immigrants and create those synergies you were discussing before, and that diversity also in the immigration population that somehow creates, you know, uh, agglomeration events and factors that somehow can help the economies to grow. And essentially, certainly, it's an immigration that doesn't depress wages, but rather, rather the opposite. So I was wondering whether, you know, the education policy that somehow try to, tries to attract foreigners, highly educated foreigners, can be a good way of uh, somehow fostering the good, positive impact of immigration. I think um, I haven't thought as much about the uh, Italian setting. Uh, I would say uh, I have thought a little bit in, in research um, about the German setting. And Germany is an interesting example because um, non-Germans all know there's one place we want to live in Germany. Berlin, right? There's no jobs in Berlin. <laughs> it's like the worst possible scenario, like the places that the immigrants want to go. And we, when I, I was doing some consulting work over the last few years for Amazon, and uh, Amazon decided, okay, we're going to set up in Berlin because we can get really good programmers from all over the world that want to live in Berlin. And uh, I think that lesson might convey to other other countries that basically there there's certain uh, you know Im immigrants especially highly skilled international immigrants want to move to places that are cosmopolitan that have a lot of language uh, absorption so people can speak whatever language they speak and want to be um, able to feel like their children can go to school uh, without any difficulty and uh, in all honesty I think that the the uh, place like Berkeley, it's kind of strange, but it, it's not necessarily the most successful university in many ways. But one thing we do have is that people want to come to Berkeley in Northern California, and it's a very forgiving environment. Children can come into the school system and absorb. And so those are the things that I think really, if someone is trying to think about it, they have to say, what do we have to do to make it so that somebody who's incredibly good, uh, you know, somebody from India or China or uh, any other country, uh, would want to move here with their family for 10 years and make an investment. And some of those people, I've been doing a study in Canada recently of immigrant entrepreneurship, and um, immigrants are the rate, the fraction of people who become um, owners of companies that are large enough to become incorporated, so they're not just working by themselves, but actually hire other workers. The rate of that among immigrants in Canada is almost three times higher than it is for natives. And, I mean, we all know Canadians are not the most ambitious people, but this is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so the three, and, and so I think that it's probably more the selection of immigrants, somebody who was actually willing to move to a different country, learn a new language. Uh, you know, they're not going to be next to their mother. Um, you know, you're going to Italians are going to have to figure out how to do, get their ironing done. <laughs> but um, 
So I, I think that there, there are things to do, but you have to think fairly big. It's not just about the job per se, it's about the whole environment. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. I think we have exploited you fully. So really, thank you very much for, for, your, for your lecture and for answering all those questions. We have a cocktail upstairs. And so you're all invited to the cocktail upstairs. So uh, please, uh, it's, it's, it's in the common room upstairs. Thank you very much.